I'm Jody Poloni. I'm one of the, um, the volunteers that work on the Brattleboro Literary Festival. And I'm so pleased to be here at this event today um, with Kate Greathead and Joan Silber. So if that's who you're here to see, you're at the right place. I'll be introducing, they'll be coming up and reading, and then at the end there'll be time for Q&A, so think about your questions. And then at the end we'll meet you in the back where uh, everyone's books is selling books and authors are happy to sign your books and talk with you more at the back table. We're gonna start with Kate. I'm often attracted to books that have two names paired as a title. They promise a certain level of intimacy between characters, be it familial or romantic, rendering deep confidants or mere playfellows, as if to suggest that without the pairing, the characters would be nothing. But my favorites are the titles that deliver the promise of an interesting mother-daughter relationship. I read Kate's tender debut, Laura and Emma, beginning one afternoon and finishing into the night, immersing in the interior perspective vignettes that span time while revealing glimpses of the parallel development of both mother and daughter as their roles shift and mirror each other. While some might call Laura and Emma a kind of quiet narrative, I found the psychological tension gripping, relieved by bursts, bursts of sudden character agency and by humor, subtly rendered and efficient, the work of a skillful author who layers meaning upon meaning upon meaning, and luminous and lyrical, for sure. Kate Greathead earned her MFA from the esteemed Warren Wilson Program for Writers and is a graduate of Wesleyan University. Her breakup story, One Woman's Trash, may be heard told by Kate on The Moth. She comes to Brattleboro from Brooklyn. Please welcome Kate. Thank you very much, Jody, and thank you all of you for coming out today. Um, I am just going to jump right in and start reading from the opening of my book. Um, just to explain, Laura and Emma is a novel, but it's not written in conventional chapters. It's, um, it's written in vignettes that span the life of 15 years um, of the two main characters, Laura and her daughter, Emma. Um, who's not yet born when the book begins. Um, the book is set in New York City, and it begins in 1980. Um, so I will pause in between um, vignettes. I'll pause. Um, OK. Laura sometimes woke up in the night, rattled by thoughts she'd never have during the day. A reoccurring nocturnal concern was that her apartment wasn't really hers. She owned it. Her name was on the door. There were official papers. But this wouldn't always be the case. Someday it would belong to someone else. Looking around her bedroom, envisioning everything packed up in boxes to be hauled off by movers was very unsettling. But this was the inevitable outcome of apartments. No one's really belonged to them. In a 100 years, the apartments of everyone she knew would be inhabited by future generations whose taste in music and art and films and clothes would be completely foreign to her. Not that it mattered, as she and everyone she knew would be dead. It was ridiculous to worry about, but in the sobering still of the small hours, these thoughts consumed her. And were she to have a husband, Laura imagined she'd wake him up to unload them, and his laughing at their absurdity, and her laughing back. And then, feeling reassured and safely contained within the walls that surrounded her bed, drifting back to sleep. The other time Laura thought having a husband would be nice was when something broke and it was too late to call the super. If it was after 9 o'clock and she discovered her bedroom door was swollen shut from the humidity or the smoke detector started beeping in need of a new battery, she had to live with it until the morning. That was it, though. These occasions aside, Laura was getting along very well without a man in her life. But still, it upset her, the idea that she didn't truly belong in her own apartment. Really, it doesn't matter who you marry, Laura's mother had said more than once. 
However madly in love you are in the beginning, one day you will find yourself sitting across a table from that person thinking anything, anything, anything would be better than this. <laughs> Laura had never been madly in love or even sanely in love. She didn't hate sex, but didn't particularly like it either. The idea of being expected to do it all the time seemed exhausting. She was not a romantically or sexually inclined person. She'd heard that this was the case for some people and suspected she fell into this category. But upon turning 30, she decided to seek a professional opinion and made an appointment to meet with a psychoanalyst. The office was on the ground floor of a Turtle Bay brownstone, and the analyst was comfortingly older with a kind, intelligent face. Laura could tell he'd been handsome in his youth, but in a non-threatening way. After inviting her into his office, he took a seat behind a desk and gestured for her to take the chair across from him. Before we get started, I'd like to answer any questions you might have about how this works and hear about a bit about you and what brings you here. I know how it works, Laura told him. I'm afraid I'm not here as a long-term patient. Laura paused in case he was only interested in long-term patients. When he didn't say anything, she proceeded to explain her reason for coming. Marriage had never appealed to Laura the way it did to other women. She was flattered by and appreciated the attention of men, but could do with just that. She was more than content with her life choices and current situation. Then what brings you here? I'm not sure, Laura admitted. I recently saw my internist for my annual appointment, and the results came back, and everything looked fine, and I guess I came here hoping you could perform the psychoanalytical equivalent. A routine mental, the analyst said, chuckling. You want a clean bill of mental health. Laura smiled sheepishly. Well, from what you've told me, it sounds like there are no issues. It was probably silly of me to come, she said. The analyst's face suddenly turned serious. He stood up and pointed to a couch on the other end of the room. If you would lie down, we can get started. Laura felt funny lying down in front of a stranger and asked if she could sit on the couch instead. Your choice. However, many people find it easier to open up lying down. In the spirit of cooperation, she reclined. Notebook and pen in hand, the analyst settled into an armchair beside her. Should I start with my childhood? She asked after a moment of silence. If you like, he said. Rather than sketch out her parents or brother or the general emotional atmosphere of her upbringing, upbringing, Laura began describing a morning routine from her early childhood. It was of sitting on the toilet trying to go big jobby, as her nurse called it. Marge insisted that this happen every day at the conclusion of breakfast, and Laura's day was suspended until she did it. Marge would come into the bathroom afterwards to inspect the evidence. Laura's digestive system wouldn't always cooperate with the schedule, and there were many lonely mornings of sitting on the toilet for hours, pushing and pushing and pushing until she was gasping for air and having nothing to show for her efforts. As Laura lay there reliving this, the contours of the light fixture on the ceiling went slack, and she realized she was crying. She was glad she was lying down, as it meant her analyst couldn't see her face. But then a box of Kleenex appeared and hovered above her chest. He was leaning across the space between them to offer it. Her deep breathing must have given her away. This is embarrassing, she said, taking a tissue and dotting the corners of her eyes. Not at all, he said kindly. Laura excused herself to go to the bathroom. She blew her nose and splashed cold water on her face. When she felt composed, she returned to the couch, where she resumed their session upright. Among the misperceptions others had about Laura was that she was oblivious to her looks. This was largely due to the simplicity of her wardrobe. To work, she wore a white turtleneck, one of five rotating Laura Ashley skirts, and a pair of fry cowboy boots. One year earlier, a photographer named Bill Cunningham had taken a picture of her in this outfit. Laura had been waiting at the crosswalk of Lexington and 61st and hadn't known her photograph was being taken until it appeared in a series of street portraits in the New York Times. Her mother had been the first to spot it and called Laura to tell her. Laughing too hard to speak, she'd put Laura's father on the phone, who directed her to the page of the newspaper. Laura had put the clipping under a magnet on the fridge. But then this struck her as egotistical, and so she took it down, and with the intention of keeping it safe, she'd put it somewhere she couldn't remember. Others in her social circle had also laughed at the photo. Of everyone they knew, Laura was the last person one would expect to see in the New York Times as a paragon of Manhattan style. It was true Laura had little interest in clothes, but what people assumed was her absent-minded ignorance of fashion was actually concern for the fate of the earth. 
Everything she owned would one day end up in a landfill, and she avoided acquiring anything she didn't need. She'd once heard the phrase, use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without, and guiltily thought of it every time she bought new clothes, which was itself an ordeal as it was difficult to find clothes that fit her. Laura was so small that most things had to be tailored, and to avoid the hassle, she often found herself browsing the children's section of whatever store she was in. One afternoon, she was in the boys' department of Morris Brothers Department Store on 85th and Broadway, looking for a new winter parka, when she felt something warm and moist against her thigh. She looked down and discovered a little boy, maybe three or four, burrowing his face into her jeans, seemingly for the purpose of wiping his nose. <laughs> Excuse me, Laura told him, realizing he must have mistaken her for his mother, but we're not related. The little boy looked up at her. His face darkened, and he began breathing in a husky, emotional way. With each exhalation, a green bubble of mucus protruded from his nose. You're not my mom, he told her, shaking his head. There was a petulant, accusatory edge to his tone, as though Laura had posed as his mother with the intention of kidnapping him. It's okay, Laura attempted to reassure the child. Your mom is somewhere in this door. I'll help you find her. She reached out to, the, to pat the top of his head, but this only made the boy more suspicious. And after batting her hand away, he took a doddering step backwards, lost his balance, and fell on his bottom. For a moment, he sat there in silence, a confused, slightly panicked look on his face like he was playing the part of a little boy in a movie and had forgotten his line. Then he opened his mouth and screamed. Joshua, an equally loud voice shrieked from the other end of the store. A woman came galloping toward them. See, I told you your mom was here, Laura said cheerfully, and stepped aside as the mother swooped in like a bird of prey, scooped the child up with feral urgency, and began pecking his face with kisses. As the dramatic reunion unfolded, Laura was troubled by two thoughts, the first being that this little boy had mistaken her for this other woman, who had a homely, disheveled look you often saw on the Upper West Side. Laura knew she was not a smart dresser, but she didn't like to think she was in the same category as this woman. The second wasn't so much a thought as a sudden awareness of her irrelevance in their universe, the parameters of which seemed to have contracted so that it contained only the woman and the boy that this hurt Laura's feelings, confused and embarrassed her. With the exception of Margaret, near, nearly all her contemporaries had children by now, though a few had privately admitted to feeling initially bewildered by the little creature they'd brought home from the hospital, Edith going so far as to compare its appearance to a space alien, it was only a matter of time before they fell under the spell of unconditional maternal love. Though this seemed to be the universal trend, it still struck Laura as a roll of the dice, to allow fate to assign you a person whom you were expected to adore for the rest of your life. You did not get to choose your child, and while all the mothers she knew gave the impression of having received exactly what they would have ordered, it still seemed like a cavalier thing to do. Also selfish, it had taken the world's population until 1804 to reach one billion, and another 123 years to double. What Laura imagined people assumed would be her greatest regret, not having any children, she considered her greatest gift to the planet. How do you feel about money? Her analysts asked during their second session. Laura thought it was an odd question. She wasn't sure what there was to say. Her income wasn't much, but she had a modest trust which generated annual dividends that her father's accountant would transfer into her bank account. This extra money allowed her to contribute to various nonprofits, such as National Resources Defense Council, the New York City Commission for the Homeless, National Public Radio, and the Barnard Scholarship Fund. What remained of this money she hadn't earned went towards Christmas tips for her super seamstress, the man who resold her boots, the cashiers at a grocery store, the owner of the hot dog cart where she bought her af afternoon Coca-Cola, her male woman, and the nice family who ran the laundromat across the street. She didn't share any of this with her analyst because it didn't feel worth his time. Many people are uncomfortable discussing money, he said after a silence. I'm not uncomfortable discussing it, Laura clarified. It just doesn't interest me. It doesn't feel relevant to what I'm doing here. And what would you say you're doing here? I thought analysis was mostly for figuring out the emotional impact of your childhood. And do you think, the analyst asked, that growing up in such a wealthy family had any kind of impact? The word wealthy embarrassed Laura. It was not a word she or anyone she was close to used, and she wished her analyst hadn't spoken it. There are a lot of things that are difficult for me to talk about, she said, things I've never discussed with anyone. Money isn't one of them. What about sex, he asked. 
The whole point of having the patient lie down, as Laura understood it, was to avoid seeing the analyst and thus reduce inhibition. But today, the analyst's armchair was positioned at an angle where one of his shoes and a part of his leg poked into her frame of vision. He must have been sitting with his legs crossed because the foot was suspended in the air and it bopped with a restless energy that was incongruent with his calm and measured speaking voice. As with many men, his pants rode up his calf where, where his legs were crossed and his black socks only went up so far, exposing an inch of pale, hairy shin bone. What about it? Laura asked him back. Well, the foot bopping picked up with the speed of a dog's wagging tail. Do you ever masturbate? I'm going to read one more section. Margaret, that's Laura's oldest friend. Margaret had once confessed to feeling similarly, similarly indifferent to intercourse, but this didn't stop her from marrying Tripp, a boy they'd grown up with who had a reputation for a voracious and often indiscriminate sexual appetite, among other vices. As a teenager, Tripp had once gotten so tipsy at a cotillion ball that he'd vomited and a string bean had come out of his nostril. <laughs> Though this had happened over half a lifetime ago, Laura still had trouble looking at him without this image coming to mind. Evidently, this was not the case for Margaret, who upon being declared husband and wife, thrust a triumphant fist into the air, like an Olympian mounting the pedestal after receiving the gold. Following the ceremony, there was a reception at the Carlisle. A fleet of London town cars had been rented to chauffeur the guests, but Laura decided to walk. It had rained earlier, and the late April air was ripe with freshly fallen petals and the loamy odor of wet concrete. Puddles reflected quivering images of the blossoming pear trees that lined Madison Avenue. The sun on the sidewalk radiated warmth. It felt like the city was waking up from a nap. Laura could have walked all afternoon, but eventually she arrived at the Carlisle and felt obligated to go in. The reception was a tedious marathon of 30-second conversations with people she knew, knew but didn't really know. None of the toasts mentioned the string bean incident, especially not hers, which Laura realized halfway into it, focused exclusively on the earlier years of her friendship with Margaret and offered nothing in the way of the woman Margaret had become or of Margaret and Tripp, which was what wedding toasts were supposed to do, especially when you were in the maid of honor. When it was time for the bride to toss the bouquet, instead of haphazardly chucking it into the throng of little girls who stood on the dance floor waving their arms above their heads, Margaret, who happened to be very coordinated, threw it in such a way that it soared up and diagonally across the dance floor and landed at Laura's feet. All eyes on her, she had no choice but to pick it up. The girls flocked over and she handed it to the youngest of them who squealed over her prize. Um, so, Laura and Emma, I'm, I think I'm going to wait mostly to talk about my book toward the Q&A session. Is that OK? OK. So I'm going to let Joan go next. Thank you. So up next is Joan Silver. And this is um, a little bit of a, like a fangirl moment for me to get to be up here. Um, and Joan doesn't even know this yet, because I haven't told her. But um, I first became aware of her and her work when my MFA thesis advisor assigned me to read her link story collection, Ideas um, from Heaven, because I was working on a collection where one, one character in a story would then become a central character in the next, and on it went. And so um, I, I feel like Joan's books, in the absence of her being a writing teacher for me personally, her books have been some of my best mentors as a writer. So it's so, it's so nice to have this privilege. Jones uh, Silver's writing career spans 30 years, during which she has consistently produced top-notch fiction, eight books in all, as well as the craft missive, The Art of Time in Fiction, published by Grey Wolf Press. She has been called, um, quote, America's own Alice Munro by Washington Post reviewer Charles Finch, referring to how she is, quote, a master of the compression and dilation of time, what time and nothing else can reveal to people about themselves, unquote. 
but perhaps Finch's comparison may also allude to the way in which Joan Silver's work elevates ordinary life to greater heights through the emotional evacuation, I'm sorry, the emo emotional excavation of character and renders it in stunning prose. It is no surprise then that Joan Silver should achieve notable critical acclaim, fellowships, prizes, and grants, well-earned honors, far too many to name here. Instead, let's hear Joan read and talk from her new novel, Improvement, winner of the 2017 National Book Critics Circle Award in Fiction and the 2018 Penn Faulkner Award. Please join me in welcoming Joan. Thank you all. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and honored to be reading with Kate. Um, I'm going to mostly read and just talk a little in between stuff. I'm going to, um, I'm reading from Improvement, the new book. I had a Turkish lunch and I insisted on showing the guy. I have a, a, a Turkish rug on my cover. I, I don't know how fascinated he was by this, but, um, but part of the book does take place in Turkey, just a, a little part. Um, I'm just going to read you the opening. Uh, and then I'll move on in the chapter and read one section and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit. <clears throat> Everyone, know, can, you, can you guys hear me? The mic is at the right level? Okay. Everyone knows this can happen. People travel and they find places they like so much, they think they've risen to their best selves just by being there. They feel distant from everyone at home who can't begin to understand. They take up with beautiful locals, they settle in, they get used to how everything works, they make homes, but maybe not forever. I had an aunt who was such a person. She went to Istanbul when she was in her 20s. She met a good looking carpet seller from Cappadocia. She'd been a classics major in college and, and had many questions to ask him, many observations to offer. He was a gentle and intelligent man who spent his days talking to travelers. He come to think he no longer knew what to say to Turkish girls, and he loved my aunt's airy conversation. When her girlfriends went back to Greece, she stayed behind and moved in with him. This was in 1970. His shop was in Sultan Ahmet, where tourists went, and he lived in Fener, an old and jumbled neighborhood. Kiki, my aunt, liked having people over, and their apartment was always filled with men from her boyfriend's region and expats of various ages. She was happy to cook big semi-Turkish meals and make up the couch for anyone passing through. She helped out in the store, explain carpet motifs to anyone who walked in. Those were stars for happiness, scorpion designs to keep real scorpions out. In her letters home, she sounded enormously pleased with herself. She dropped Turkish phrases into her sentences, reported days spent sipping chai and kahve. All this became lore in my family. She wrote to her father, who suffered from considerable awkwardness in dealing with his children. Her mother had died some six years before. And she wrote to her kid brother, who was busy hating high school. The family was Jewish from a, a forward-thinking leftist strain. Kiki had gone to camps where they sang songs about children of all nations, so no one had any bigoted objections to her Turkish boyfriend. Kiki sent home to Brooklyn a carpet, she said, was from the Taurus Mountains. Her father said, very handsome colors. I see you are a connoisseur. No one is walking on it, I promise. <laughs> then. Kiki's boyfriend's business took a turn for the worse. There was a flood in the basement of his store, and a bill someone never paid, and a new shop nearby that was getting all the business, or something. The store had to close. Her family thought this meant that Kiki was coming home at last. But no, Osman, her guy, had to move back to the village he was from to help, to help his father who raised pumpkins for their seed oil, also tomatoes, green squash, and eggplant. Kiki was up for the move. She wanted to see the real turkey, 
Istanbul was really so Western now. Cappadocia was very ancient, and she couldn't wait to see the volcanic rock. She was getting married. Her family in Brooklyn was surprised about that part. Were they invited to the wedding? Apparently not. In fact, it had already happened by the time they got the letter. I get to wear a beaded hat and a glitzy headscarf, the whole shebang, Kiki wrote. I still can't believe it. Neither could any of her relatives. But they sent presents once they had an address, a microwave oven, a Mr. Coffee, an electric blanket for the cold mountains. They were a practical and liberal family. They wanted to be helpful. They didn't hear from Kiki for a while, and her father worried that some of the gifts had been stolen in the mail. I know it's hard for you to imagine, Kiki wrote, but we do very well without electricity here. <laughs> Every morning I make a wood fire in the stove, very good smelling smoke. I make a little fire at the bottom of the water heater, too. Kiki built fires? No one could imagine her as the pioneer wife. Her brother, Alan, who later became my father, asked what kind of music she listened to there and if she had a radio. She sent him cassette tapes of favorite Turkish singers, first a crappy male crooner, and then a coolly plaintive woman singer who really was very good. Alan was always hoping to visit, but first he was in college and working as a house painter in the summers, and then he had a real job in advertising that he couldn't leave. Kiki said not a word about making any visits home. Her father offered to pay for two tickets to New York so they could all meet her husband, but Kiki wrote, oh, dad, spend your money on better things. No one nagged her. She'd been a touchy teenager given to sullen outbursts, and everyone was afraid of that Kiki appearing again. She stayed for eight years. Her letters said, my husband thinks I sew as well as his sisters, and I'm rereading my copy of Ovid in Latin. It's not bad. And winter is so long this year, I hate it. Osman has already taught me all he knows about the stars. No one could make sense of who she was now or put the parts together. There were no children and no pregnancies that anyone heard about, and the family avoided asking. Her brother was finally about to get himself over for a visit when Kiki wrote to say, guess what, I'm coming back at last, for good. Cannot wait to see you all. Cannot wait my ass, her brother said. She waited fine, what's so irresistible now? No, the husband was not coming with her. My life here has reached its natural conclusion, Kiki wrote. Osman will be my dear friend forever, but we've come to the end of our road. So who ran around on who? The relatives kept asking. <laughs> She'll never say, will she? So um, that section, although it's about Kiki, is actually told from the point of view of her young niece. Um, so that was in the 70s, as you heard. Um, and the current time action, the, so Kiki's already in her 60s, um, uh, the young niece, Reina, is a single mom. She's in her mid-20s, and she has a little boy who's four. Um, and um, they both live in New York. Kiki has relocated to the East Village. And um, Raina, the niece, lives up in Harlem in a, an illegal sublet. Um, and um, at the time of the sort of central action of the first chapter, um, Hurricane Sandy has happened. And really, part of the story was inspired by, uh, I, I live in New York, and I lived through Hurricane Sandy. and. Um, uh, the striking thing that happened was that the Con Ed Tower got knocked out on 14th Street, so all of the apartments downtown were without electricity, which for most of us meant without water, because the pumps have to pump the water, um, and eventually no heat, because it went on until um, around this time in October, a little later. Um, so uh, Kiki the aunt um, is in the 
no electricity zone, and the niece is fine. Harlem doesn't have any problems with electricity. And she goes and checks on her aunt at one point. And of course, Kiki's live with a lot of electricity. So Kiki's fine, yeah, eh, I got rice I can boil, I got, you know, I got candles, I'm fine. Um, uh, but um, Rena, the niece keeps saying, oh, you can come stay with us if you want to. You don't want to have to stay here. And then I'm going to read you the, the next section after they've paid a visit. And this is Rena talking to the, the niece. <coughs> At my job, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm on the wrong page. Give me just a second. Oops. Oh, here I am. Wait, I have these little little markers, but I don't always know where they are. Okay, here it is. Fortunately, I know the book well, so I can find things. Um, so this is Raina talking. I had an extra reason for wanting my aunt to stay, not to be one of those mothers who was always desperate for babysitting, but I needed a babysitter. My boyfriend was spending three months at Rikers Island. That's the jail of New York, as you probably all know. Um, for all of October, I'd gone to see him once a week. He was there for selling five ounces of weed. Who thinks that should even be a crime? And it made a big difference to him to have someone visit. I planned to go there again this week once the subways were back on and buses were going over the bridge again. But it was hard bringing Oliver, that's her little four-year-old, who wasn't his kid and who needed a lot of attention during those toyless visits. I love Boyd, and I wouldn't have said, I, I love Boyd, but I wouldn't have said I loved him more than others I'd been with. Fortunately, no one asked, not even Boyd. There is no need for people to keep mouthing off about how much they felt in his view. Some degree of real interest, some persistence in showing up was enough. Every week, I watched him waiting in that visitor's room, another young African-American in a stupid jumpsuit. The sight of him, heavy-faced, wearing, wary, waiting to smile slightly, always got to me. And when I hugged him, light hugs were permitted, I think, it's still Boyd, it's Boyd here. Oliver could be a nuisance. Sometimes he was very, very whiny from standing in too many different lines, or he was incensed that he couldn't bring in his giant plastic dinosaur, or he got overstimulated and had to nestle up to Boyd and complain at length about some kid who threw sand in the park. You're having adventures, right, Boyd said. Meanwhile, I was trying to ask Boyd if he'd had an okay week and why not. I had an hour to give him the joys of my conversation. Dealing with those two at once was not the easiest. I got a phone call from Aunt Kiki on the second day after the hurricane. How would you feel about my coming over for our after work to take a hot shower, she said. I can bring a towel. I've got piles of towels. Our shower is dying to see you, I said, and Oliver will lend you his ducky. Kiki, 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 Oliver yelled when she came through the door. Maybe I'd worked him up too much in advance. <laughs> We'd gotten the place very clean. When my aunt came out of the bathroom, dressed again in her slacks and sweater, and with a steam pink face under the turban of her towel, I handed her a glass of red wine. A person without heat or water needs alcohol, I said. <laughs> And we sat down to meatloaf, which I was good at, and mashed potatoes, which Oliver had learned to eat with garlic. This is a feast, she said. Did you know the sultans had feasts that went on for two weeks? Oliver was impressed. This one could go on longer, I said. You should stay over or come back tomorrow. I mean it. Tomorrow was what I needed. It was the visiting night for inmates with last names from M to Z. Maybe the power will be back by then, Kiki said. Maybe, maybe. At Rikers, Boyd and the others had spent the hurricane under lockdown. No wanderings off into the torrent. Rikers had its own generator, and the buildings were in the center of the island, too high to wash away. It was never meant to be a place you might swim from. You know, I have this boyfriend, Boyd, I said. 
Kiki was looking at her plate while I gave her the situation about the weekly visits, as much as I could tell in, in front of Oliver. Oh, shit, she said. She had to finish chewing to say, OK, sure, OK, I'll come right from work. When I leaned over to embrace her, she seemed embarrassed. Oh, please, she said. No big deal. What an interesting person Kiki was. What could I ever say to her that would throw her for a loop? Best not to push it, of course. No need to warn her not to tell my parents either, not Kiki. And maybe she had a boyfriend of her own that I didn't even know about. She wasn't someone who told you everything. She wasn't showering with him wherever he was. Maybe he was married, a man that age. Oh, where was I going with this? When Kiki turned up the next night, she was 45 minutes later than she'd said, and I had given up on her several times over. She bustled through the door saying, don't ask me how the subways are running. Go, go, get out of here, go. She looked younger, all flushed like that. What a babe she must have once been, or at least a hippie sweetheart. Oliver clambered all over her. Will you hurry up and get out of here, she said. Go. The subway, which had only started running that day, was indeed slow to arrive and very crowded. But the bus near Queen's, near Queen's Plaza that went to Rikers was the same as ever. After the first few stops, all the white people emptied out except me. I read People magazine while well, we inched our way toward the bridge to the island. Love was making a mess of the lives of any number of celebrities. <laughs> and look at that teenage girl across the aisle in the bus, combing her hair, checking it in a mirror, pulling the strands across her face to make it hang right. Girl, I wanted to say, he fucked up bad enough to get himself where he is, and you're still worried he won't like your hair? <laughs> of course, I was all moosed and lipstick myself. I had standards. But you couldn't wear anything too revealing. No rips or see-throughs. They had rules. Visitors must wear undergarments. Mm -hmm. Poor Boyd. After I stood in a line and put my coat and purse in a locker and showed my ID to the guards and got searched and stood in a line for one of Riker's own buses and got searched again, I sat in the room to wait for him. It was odd being there without Oliver. The wait went on too long. It wasn't like you could bring a book to occupy you. And then I heard Boyd's familiar name read from the list. Those jumpsuits didn't flatter anyone. But when we hugged, he smelled of soap and Boyd, and I was sorry for myself to have him away for so long. Hey there, he said. Didn't mean to get here so late, I said. Boyd wanted to hear about the hurricane and who got hit the worst. And Kiki became my material. Oh, she had her candles and her pots of water and her cans of soup and her bags of rice. She couldn't see why everybody was so upset. Can't keep him down, old people like that, he said. Good for her. That's the best thing I've heard all week. I went on about the gameness of Kiki, the way she'd taught me the right way to climb trees when I was young, when my mother was only worried I'd fall on my head. I didn't know you were a climber. Have to tell Claude. His friend Claude, much more of an athlete than Boyd was, had recently discovered the climbing wall at some gym. Boyd himself was a couch potato, but a lean and lanky one. Was he getting puffy now? A little. Claude's a monster on that wall. Got Lynette doing it, too. Lynette was Claude's sister and Boyd's last girlfriend before me. Girls can do that stuff fine, he says. When did he say that? They came by last week, the whole gang. What gang? Only three visitors allowed. Lynette was here and Maxwell. They came to show support. I appreciate it, you know? I'll bet you did, I thought. I was trying not to leap to any conclusions. It wasn't as if she could have crept into the corner with him for a quickie, though you heard rumors of such things, urban myths. Does Claude still have that stringy haircut? He does, looks like a root vegetable. Man should go to my barber. The Rikers barber had given Boyd an onion look if you were citing vegetables. 
They're coming again Saturday. You're not coming Saturday, right? I never came on Saturdays. I gave him a look. Because if you are, he said, I'll tell them not to come. You couldn't blame a man who had nothing for wanting everything he could get his hands on. That was pretty much what I thought on the bus ride back to the subway. Oh, I could blame him. I was spending an hour and a half to get there every week and an hour and a half to get home so he could entertain his ex. I was torn between being pissed off and my preference for not making trouble. But why had Boyd told me? The guy could keep his mouth shut when he needed to. He didn't think he needed to because I was a good sport. What surprised me even more was how painful this was starting to be. I could imagine Boyd greeting Lynette in his offhand Mr. Cool way. Can't believe you dropped in. Lynette, silky and tough, telling him it had been too long. But what was so great about Boyd that I should twist in torment from what I was seeing too clearly in my head? I was sitting on the bus during this anguish. I wanted Boyd to comfort me. He had a talent for that. If you were insulted because some asshole at daycare said your kid's shoes were unsuitable, if you splurged on a nice TV and then realized you'd overpaid, if you got fired from your job because you used up sick days and it wasn't your fault, Boyd could make it seem hilarious. He could imitate people he'd never met. He could remind you it was part of the ever-expanding joke of human trouble, not just you. Thank you. I'm just going to say two things about it, and then I'm going to sit down, and we'll, we're, we'll both answer questions. I want to say one thing, though, because this is a novel, and um, uh, you know, I ha Jody spoke so nicely about my writing Link stories. So it was in the last three books before this were Link stories, and I felt that I had done my best work in that form. Um, but I wanted to do a novel. I wanted to do some. You know, I didn't want to keep doing the same thing. Um, so I ended up writing a novel that's about as close to Link stories as you can get. Um, we have the first two sections are told by Raina. Then other characters come in, and then Raina comes in at the end. Kiki has a little bit in the middle. Um, it's a little more unified. The the structure is kind of like a cup to hold these different other things going on, instead of being a sort of connecting link. Um, but I, I love, I love the, I love both those forms. I love the idea of, I think in some ways I'm sort of a miniaturist by nature, but I wanted to expand, and the form gave me a way to do it and to include lots of different time frames and lots of different periods of time in history and lots of different characters. So, and I, and there's more of that around. I mean, there, there's, there's more people are doing it, and it's not that. I was so clever I sent, set a trend, although of course I'd like to think that. But, but really because I think we live in an era in which we want more, more contact with lots of other things. I find myself now quoting what my mother used to say to me, much to my displeasure as a child. My mother used to say, you're not the only pebble on the beach, <laughs> which was the thing mothers said then. They talked differently to their children. Um, and of course, you know, this was not good news to me. Um, <laughs> But I, and I would say, I know, um, but I think you, we never know. We always think we're the only pebbles. So part of what fiction, uh, uh, this kind of fiction particularly, you know, has a net that casts the whole thing. But I think fiction generally is a big reminder, not only that there are other pebbles on the beach, but that other people have interior lives. And the sort of rapture in reading is that we get to think that we're other people. You know, I actually think I'm Jane Eyre, even though I know she's not a real person. So uh, I, have, I have both feelings in my head at, at once, I think, uh, as I read. So I just wanted to say those two things and sort of mention about the form. And then I think we'll answer anything, right? Where, is that where we stand up and do it? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. So ask, us, ask either of us anything. And you're using the vignette um, formula, or formula, the form. Uh -huh. uh, my daughter and I wrote a memoir, we won a prize, but it was like three years of our lives where we're going through parallel processes. Uh -huh. And I find it hard after that to continue on, um, 
Do you know what I mean? I don't, is this just what the That's a great saying? question, actually. Yes, because you did this work together. Yeah, yeah. So it's very profound, very evocative. Um, you know, how the, you know, I'm trying to do my legacy thing, and, you know, we're go, both going through parallel processes of separating and individuating and all that stuff. But at that period, I just find it very difficult now to. To continue writing? Yeah. In, because that form. Is it the form or the? Oh, oh that we won a prize and then yeah. it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have only written one book, and I can say I feel like when you a similar feeling of I, you know, hopefully not downhill forever, but but this feeling of oh I did it I I did this thing that I've been trying to do for so long and. And there's a moment of confidence, and then you, and then you're back to the blank page, wanting to start anew. And one thing that helped me write this first book, which is something I want to do again moving forward, is I, I was working with the material in this book for years and years, and I I just couldn't find the right structure or format for it. And then one day I discovered an older book called uh, Mrs. Bridge. Has anyone ever heard of that book by Evan S. Connell? And I thought this is it. And I basically copied the structure. I maybe shouldn't admit that exactly. <laughs> and um, and I realized for my next book, I, I feel like I need to find my next Mrs. Bridge, because um, that form just works so well for me. So maybe a, a great thing to do when you're in that moment is, is just read and look for other books for guidance. You can keep using the same form for a while, too. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's not, there, I, I mean that sincerely. I mean, there's no, if a form is fertile for you, there may, it, it, it's hard to know whether your problem is the form or the material, maybe right. that you're seeking other material as well. But those are, those are both really interesting issues. Well, a follow up for you, Joan, is um, I just read The Blind Assassin, um, Margaret Adler's mm -hmm. book club. So your stories are linked, and hers is sort of a, I don't know what it's called. I haven't read The Blind Deception, so, so you're going to have to uh, well, summarize it. Basically, it's a story within a story that I didn't know till the end. Because in the middle, I was like, this is really, there was science fiction, there was everything. Yeah. So, it, so, but yours is all linked, though, so yours isn't a story within a story. No, I haven't done that. That's an interesting way to, so, I, I mean, we should all feel free, I think. Do you know what I mean? That 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 there are all these different, and what you want is, you want the form to support what you're trying to do. So it isn't just, oh, I have to find a good form, I have to find a good form for what I'm trying. And, and also, the process of writing is very trial and error. It's, very, it's a really messy, people think you just sit down and write, you know? <laughs> but it's very, so if, if a form is appealing to you, it's worth trying, I guess, is my, my you know, there's a reason that, it, that it's, Pulling at you, but am I not answering your question? Um, sort of, and then I thought I should branch out to fiction because then you can just do whatever. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I I believe that you should do whatever. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was wondering how you actually get yourself to sit down and write every day, and what your motivations are, your process. You should answer that first, because you're in the stages of that, in a way. Um, I, I'm, I'm married to another writer, and we're sort of op on opposite ends of the spectrum as far as I'm someone who, and this is not a good thing, but I, I sort of need to feel inspired. I need the juice. And, um, but I feel like to be successful, you sort of have to be more disciplined. There are days where you just don't, you're not feeling it, but you have to make yourself sit down and work. It's a, you know. Um, it can be more of a chore some days, but I'm, um, in the past, I've been more of a, I mean, I write a little bit every day, but I'm more, I'm driven by inspiration, less by discipline and structure. I'm, I'm working on that because I just had a kid, and now I don't have the opportunity to, you know, my life is a little more complicated right now. But, um, yeah, you want to? Um, I, I mean, I think ha habits are important, so I, I'm sort of eccentric, and then I work between lunch and dinner. Most writers work in the morning. Um, but if I have had my last dessert, I, I, I prolong it a little bit after lunch. Um, but if I'm really done, around two or so, I'll, you know, I know I'm supposed to be writing. So it's not that I always, 
automatically snap to it. You know, I might check my email for a long time or something. But it's basically, you know, that that's the time I have to write. I'm a very compartmentalized person in a lot of ways. But, but that really, I'm supposed to be writing then if I'm not doing something else. I, I, I don't have every single day of the week to do it. Um, but there's some way in which the, the habit is very important. And it's more important to me to show up than to measure the progress. I have no idea how many words I've written or if I wrote the same sentence for three hours. And that's fine. I don't really care. Um, sometimes um, writing two sentences gets me really far because all of a sudden I realized what the piece was about. So you don't you don't you don't know how you know you don't know how it's going to go. But showing up is really cr crucial, and you sort of have to make yourself. You know, there's no other. You have to make yourself do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's no <laughs> enticement. You can re you can reward yourself at various points. Yeah. There, there's chocolate for a reason. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but you really you just have to get there. Yeah. Yes. For both of you, how and when did you know that you were a writer? Oh. Um, I think as a child, I don't think I knew I was a writer, but I feel like I was always sort of telling myself a, there was always a story in my head and I was the protagonist, especially when suffering some kind of injustice, you know, where the world would see it one way, but my secret audience in my head would see it the other way where I was. Um, and then as I got older, it just, it was the thing I liked to do more than anything else. Um, I too, I, I think also because of the intensity of reading, I did the same thing. I had those same narratives <laughs> go, going on. Um, but I, I had other things. I mean, I wanted to be a movie star. I had a lot of, you know, great <laughs> ideas. Um, but I, th I think I love the same thing. I love doing it. I love making up stories. I think I was praised for it a little bit in school. Um, I wrote poems too, which, which were really awful. You know? <laughs> sort of bad imitations of Victorian children's poetry. But, but I, but it was all. You know, gratifying. Um, also, um, I did. I was able to study it as an undergraduate, um, and in, in now it's more common. But that's how we make our money. But it, but in those days, it, it 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 was more unusual, and I think that that furthered me. I think that was more crucial than I knew. Thank you. Yes. How do your characters make themselves known to you? Are they loosely based on people you've met or know intimately, or do they suddenly just knock on your brain and show up? Oh, I wish they did. I wish they did. <laughs> Somebody said, was it Stefan who said this morning that he didn't get characters that way? It was, that was did. Teddy. Oh, yeah. Teddy said that. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I'll just quickly answer. For the, my, I often, for some reason, there's certain ways in which my imagination is much more fertile than others. I have no imagination when it comes to certain basic things like place, institutions, places, settings, and even like people's looks. I'll take... I'll take someone I know from my life, oftentimes, and maybe their, I'll, I'll use their appearance or something about them, some little quirk they have, and then I'll invent the rest. But I need some kind of grounding in reality in order for my imagination to take over for the rest. So I feel a little bad um, for my mother when I wrote this book because I, the main character, Laura, is uh, her to a T physically, but I, her psyche is completely different. Um, so she came to me, I don't know, I, I needed some sort of, for me, in order to create a character, I need some sort of basis in reality, and then, I guess it's a really weird answer, but then my imagination does the rest, to allow my imagination, I guess, to take over, and also in, to also make sure that I, because I don't want real people in my, in my fiction, that makes me nervous, um, so often, like, I, I took my mother's exterior, and then I went, in a whole other direction as far as her, the psyche. I haven't, I haven't used real people since I was young. When I was young, I, I, I sort of did. Although usually there were, they were people who were dead, who, you know, like, who, who couldn't be injured you know, mm -hmm. by, by my using them. Um, but now they're almost all made up. But they, they do partake of different things that I've noticed you know, by, from people. But I try and invent them. And I'm often inventing them from a situation. Um, uh, like I have in a piece I'm working on now, I, I have someone who comes from a family of arch conservatives, but is not himself. Yeah. Um, so, and and from that, I 
you know, I've constructed this person and given him things to do. And, and so it's sort of one thing leads to another. But it's a very, it's, a, it's an imagining process. It's a very gradual imagining process. And I, um, I take notes a lot as I'm working uh, and then go back to the writing of the piece itself. And I also keep correcting, like, oh, no, he wouldn't do that. That's what, you know. <laughs> so I talk to my dog as I'm doing it, like, that was a stupid idea, Lucille, you know. Um, but but, uh, but uh, there's a lot of back and forth about it. And then once it's going, it's more formed. Then I know what the character would do. But it never feels as if they're autonomous, I have to say. It never feels like that I've created these wonderful people who can then take care of things for me. I always feel like I'm, I'm laboring uh, to get it going. Well, that's, that was what I was going to ask you. Do you feel like your characters take on a life of their own and then just take over? So do you kind of have an idea of how the ending is going to be, or does it just progress? I usually have an, in, uh, an idea about the ending, but not the middle, I would say. I wish I had, I struggle with endings. Um, yeah, I more have an idea of the character. I'm, I'm more, I often when I start something new, I'm more interested in the character than the story, and I need to work on, on putting them in a situation and developing the story, but it always starts with a character for me. But they never, I, they never take over, do you know? Yeah. And, uh, I wish they did. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to ask a very similar question, just where did you get your inspiration for these particular stories and the themes that evolved? Uh -huh. So <clears throat> it was more about, because each, you know, it's a very, well, all books have different stories, but um, this particular story, where did you get your inspiration for the, the beginning theme and then when you went with it? And did you even have that, or did it just evolve? You know, you had a character and then went with that. I'm not sure whether your inspiration was the two characters, you know, or with that inspiration for the story and the family and the relationship. It's just it's always fascinating to me how people's imagination, how writers of fiction with your imagination create these incredible stories. <laughs> well, we're always looking. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in this case, uh, there were two things. One, it was Hurricane Sandy, and there was a news report that said that quite elderly people in a housing project in Brooklyn had been visited by social workers, and they responded the way Kiki does in the story, like, we're fine, we don't need electricity, we're fine, you know. Uh, and we're very proud of their self-reliance. Um, and They were glad probably to get the bottles of water someone was carrying up the stairs, but they were, so I'm very interested in self-reliance as a quality. I think that's something that I admire. So the character of Kiki sort of formed from that. Um, and um, I had been to Turkey as a, just as a wandering tourist three times, and I've always wanted to find a way to use it. So giving her a, a handsome Turkish husband was a, <laughs> uh, a, a way to do that. And then I wanted someone young in it, so I got, and, I teach young people. In fact, sometimes, sometimes when I, I gave a reading in my own building at one point, and they said, I live on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, and they said, you have this middle class Jewish girl who has tattoos all over. I mean, is that right? I said, I teach those students. <laughs> take, take my word for it. I didn't make that up, you know. I have no tattoos myself, but believe me, you know. So some of it, you know, I'm taking, exactly, I'm taking stuff from, from real life, but I'm, I'm building some sort of, and then once you have the two, characters going, they, it's not that they take over for you, but there's, and there's a way in which, for instance, these two characters don't envy each other. Do you know? They're at different stages in life, so they, they each think they're a little better than the other, and that makes, and they misunderstand each other, and that makes things happen. But it's fun, when, the most fun is when it gets going. For me, the hardest part is the, the initials part. Um. This being my first book, I think this is often the case for a writer's first book. It's largely drawn from or inspired by um, the world I knew growing up. Um, there's a lot of childhood material, not so much my life, but the setting in the world. And um, I grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which is often depicted in books and movies in this sort of glamorized, elegant way. And that was not, not the way I saw it growing up in this place. I sort of saw it as a, um, this is funny because I did, I, someone asked me this question to, a few nights ago I did a reading at a, in the Upper East Side, surrounded by the kind of people that I wrote about and it was like kind of awkward to answer the question. <laughs> Basically the answer is I wanted to show what a toxic place it is. <laughs> and the ways in which it can produce um, sort of tragic figures. Um, 
And uh, I wanted to, my, this book was, I think, largely inspired by, yeah, growing up in this, in this world and uh, the pain and shame that I felt um, growing up, coming to age and realizing that I was part of this, um, I always felt like an outsider, but I, I lived in this world of affluence and wealth and um, attitudes of entitlement and sort of repression and waspiness and all these things that I that I didn't want to be and I didn't want to be associated with. And I guess this book was sort of an exercise in, I don't know, ex accepting that I am from this place and sort of wanting to create a, a portrait of it through, through my eyes. Um, Come move to Vermont. That's, that was my life dream. Growing up, I always wanted to live in Vermont ever since I was a little girl. We had cousins in Stowe growing up, and I was obsessed with the, this is really silly, but I was obsessed with the sound of music and the Vaughn tracks. When they had to leave Austria, they moved to Vermont, and I always wanted to live in Vermont. I want to know, Florence, did you go to Turkey? Did you go up into the. Oh, yeah, I've been to, been to Turkey. Did I did go to Rikers, too. Just wondering about the experience yeah. of writing about them. Did you have it in your story and visit, or was it part of your past that you then? No, it was, part, it was, part, it was actually, I was writing. Uh, uh, Turkey, I had in, in, I've been to Turkey a few time, times, not in a while now, though, as a, as a tourist, and, you know, have, it's such a complicated place. And it also, I mean, I loved being a tourist there. And one time I went to the East with a, with a special guide we had. It was wonderful. But it has changed in the public imagination since I started to work on it, for good reasons. It always has you know, this very varied you know, uh, um, you know, history and, and um, stuff that's going on now. So I, I wanted to write, you know, I was so happy to find a way to like, put it in, in something. Um, and I'm always interested, I, I lived abroad when I was younger, I lived for a year in Italy, and I'm always interested in expats in places and how they adapt and um, you know, how local they become and not local. So that was gonna come into that issue. Um, the Rikers thing, in fact, people say, oh, and you did research at Rikers. I cannot imagine they would let anybody do research at Rikers by just showing up. It seems highly, it's hard to be there even as a visitor. They're not gonna let you come with your little notepad. Um, but unfortunately, my, my beloved friend's beloved nephew was there and I got to visit him I don't, you know, as often as I could, kind of. Um, so I got to wait in those lines. And in fact, when I first read it, I showed it to my friend, and he said, you left out one of the lines that you had to wait in, you know. Um, but uh, he, he's seen it, and he was actually pleased that he had some, you know, that, it, that the thing had an effect on the writing. So I was happy about that. Um, but, but, so, but in fact, as soon as I was there, I thought, oh, I, I, I hope there's a way I can use this, because this is kind of amazing, you know. Um, so you're always trying to use something exceptional that's happened to you and to also to fit, I mean, in real life you're always trying to fit whatever happens into a larger scheme of the world that, you know, you're digesting what happens to you and trying to think what you make of it. And writing is a way of doing that, you know. Yes, yeah. um, I'm I'm speak. I'm just curious to know um, how close your finished product was to like your first full draft? I'm a very disorganized writer, so I never even, I don't know if I ever, if I ever even had something that I called like a first full draft. <laughs> it just sort of metamorphosized over the years. And then one day I, my husband actually made me, he said, you have to, you can't, I would be working on it for the rest of my life. <laughs> and he was like, at a certain point, you just, you, you send it out and you try to call it a day. Um. <laughs> I, I don't work in drafts either. So it's funny, it's sort of like there's a norm of you go through many, many rough drafts and then you finish it. I know, I've never worked that way. Yeah. So I, I think all, you know, all ways are good with, as far as writing goes. I I'm, I'm work more like a painter where, where, where I'm working on this part and filling out this part and adding that part. So it's a, so it's, a, and the sentences are sort of finished as I go. It's not written in some rough language before the end. Um, but it's a mess before it's finished. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's a different kind of mess than, than what we think of by the term rough draft. You know. But it takes years. I would, this took like four years. Yeah. And yours took. I, some, I was working on this book in some incarnation, I'd say, for like, I don't know, almost a decade. Yeah, normal. Yeah. But it's, I sort totally of think normal. that's interesting. You see it as painting. I start, I, I've always thought of it as wet clay. You know, yeah. it, could be, it could look totally different, but it's the same material and just, yeah. So are you kind of revising as you're writing? Yes, I am. 
I am. But I'm forming. Uh, there, you know, it's, uh, I write a few sentences, I write on the next day, I go back to those sentences and redo them and go on and on. So it's not, revising isn't even quite the right word either, but it's sort of like that, I think. Yours is probably different because yours is fitting together pieces, right? Um, yeah, but I, I, I do, do have too. a similar process too where I, I write each, I want to perfect each paragraph before I move on to the yeah. next as opposed to just dashing through the whole thing and then going back. I think there's a mistake of thinking of revising as polishing mm -hmm. and it really isn't. It's, it's you're trying to really um, understand what mm -hmm. you've been doing. Uh, um, Joan, I, I'm wondering how you transition. You've written a lot of books from one book to the next, and if you need to have a kind of real big sabbatical in between, or is it like when my dog is old and I'm loving him, and, but also thinking about who my next dog's going to be? Right, right, right. Dog, I have, I'm a dog person, so you're... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a little, I mean, I'm always thinking about the next dog, certainly, but I mean, you know, if we're calling the books that, but I'm, I'm very unhappy when I'm not writing, so the last thing I want is a sabbatical, but what usually happens is there's a, a business process of selling it, right? So you've sold it, and you thought you were done, but no, they want these changes, and so there, and you've already started thinking about the other things, so there's a kind of overlap it's not like you stop one and then start one, there, there, or in my case, anyway. So there's a kind of scrappiness um, in between. But, uh, and there's probably some transition, but I don't, I don't get to just go have a vacation in between. It, is, it isn't quite like that. But I'm always trying to look ahead, because if I'm not working on something, I'm really hard to be around. I'm very cranky and <laughs> impatient with every, you know, it's just, whereas if I'm working, everything becomes fodder. You know, I can look at stuff and use it. It's much better, much happier. Speaking of the business of writing, I think we want to get you guys back to Sansel Books and talk to people back okay. at the table back there. Okay.